Hello everyone, my name is Korazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the rainy hobbit hole, the rainy shire, after having built this tower in the last episode, and I think it is coming along pretty well. It is, however, missing something, and that is anything that moves. We built this tower to provide power for our drivetrain for all of our automation needs, and so far we have, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six times zero windmills. Yep, we still have zero windmills. And that is a problem, and it's a problem that we will solve this episode. But first, you may notice that it has been a few days since we last spoke, and that's because I have been busy kind of fixing some things around here and getting ready for this episode. You'll notice firstly that I have actually finished up the path up here to our agriculture trader and to our barn. So this works out pretty well. And I did some work on the chicken coop area. One, you'll hear that there are now chickens in here again. So, right, I need to kill some pigs. Those, those, those skeletons should be here. I scared myself there for a second. So, as you can see, I have added some protections for our chickens. I still don't know what happened. Oh, I killed a pig there too. I don't know what happened. I don't think there was a fox that got in, because if there was, it would still have been there. I think what may have happened is there may have been a fox that was hanging out like outside, like here, and got up onto the ledge. Sometimes, especially when like the game or a chunk is loading, creatures that are halfway into a block can sometimes reach through or even phase through those blocks. So I think that may have been what happened. That's my best guess. But I did find some chickens that were hanging around uh, beyond where that rift is and managed to wrangle them into here. I've replaced the wall, let's see, right here. These blocks are now solid, so if there are any foxes that get up onto this ledge, well, they can't. And secondly, hello rift, I put this fence in here to keep them from getting onto these blocks here. And just as an extra, extra precaution, well, one, I floored this in so we don't have any grass here that foxes could spawn on, or wolves. And also, the interior floor there is now all wood. So, yep. Now, we do have some eggs from previously. I don't know if these eggs will hatch into Generation 1s because of the chicken caring for them, or if they'll be Generation what, 4 or 5 because that's who laid them. So I'm going to have to bring some grain up here and feed them and see how it goes. Now our sheep are doing pretty well here. We have three little lambs. And we have several lactating ewes, but unfortunately most of them are generation zero. And I think that because of all the trouble I had with milking our gen zero, which never gave us anything, and our gen one, I think I'm going to wait on further milk and cheese production until we get a gen two because then we can milk them without any trouble. Now, speaking of cheese production, here we have, ooh, two barrels full of cottage cheese and one barrel full of curdled milk. Perfect. So we have spent the last several episodes kind of inching this process along. It's a lot of putting stuff in a barrel and waiting, kind of like making leather. And so it is time for us to take what's basically the final step that does unfortunately involve waiting but the final step of processing our cheese. Now, first of all, I'm going to put five salt in here and we'll get some more cottage cheese in one more day. Now these, this cottage cheese is now ready for us. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a piece of linen and right click with the barrel, shift right click with the barrel and you'll get a curd bundle. This you can put on the floor with right click and we will get a second curd bundle there we go. Put them both on the floor. And so each of these requires one piece of linen, but don't worry, you will get the linen back. And then right click with a stick and right click again to squeeze the cheese. And right click again to open them up. Hit them with some salt. They turn kind of just a little bit whiter with the salt on top. And then you are ready to put your raw salted cheese on a shelf. Let's put them here where they're visible. And they will take 
about 20 days, 22-ish days to ripen. So we'll come back in probably two or three episodes and we'll have some cheese. Now, like I said, you get your linen back. Just got to break them off the floor. Left click. And then we will do it again with this. And there we go. We now have four wheels of cheese ripening. And we'll have two more in about another day. And that is the process of cheese making from start to finish. Although this was just finish for us. Now, I have not been just fiddling with cheese in between episodes. I have also been gathering materials for today's episode. And boy, am I excited to show you what we got. First of all, I was thinking about what I wanted to do as far as design of our little blacksmith area. And so I went to our chalk area, but not for the chalk, although I did get some chalk. Here we have it up here. Instead, I dug a little higher up in the world and got some basalt. I think a forge needs some nice dark stone because we're gonna have, you know, soot and smoke from coal fires in there. I think. We might want to use some base salt so we don't see that so as much. We'll just breathe it into our lungs instead. And the second thing, I went and visited our luxurious goods trader and check out what they had. That's right, we finally have the full suit of broken forlorn hope armor. Let's grab you. Oh, and the sword too. Not, not the shield. Get you back. There we go. We have the sword. Oh man, so let's put this on and see how we look in this rather destroyed suit of armor. Okay. Okay, I'm, I'm digging it. I can see where it came from and I can see where it needs to go. But right now we look kind of derpy because it's just in such rough shape. Let's just leave all this on here for now because we're not going to fix this today. That's going to be a project, I think, for next episode, because there are some more materials we need to gather before we can actually get started on that. So let's get started on today's work. And that is we are going to install a powertrain that starts up here in our tower, our windmill tower, and it will come all the way down into our basement, into the transmission room. And from there, I am thinking that I want to build our blacksmith, our smithy area, kind of off of this corner. I think we need to have just kind of a corner smithy here and we can come in at an angle. And that way we'll also have a straight shot to our anvil and we won't have to cross the paths of any of our health hammers. Now, I think we should get started by starting with the health hammers themselves because there is a smithing aspect to them. And I think we should get that out of the way so we can have the hammerheads ready when we need them. In the current iteration of the game, held hammers do not care what material they're made out of, kind of like hammers. You can use any hammer on your anvil because it's the anvil's material that matters as far as determining what you can smith on it. And the held hammers are the same way. Now we have a couple options. We can go with tin bronze, bismuth bronze, or iron. And I am kind of leaning toward, ooh, or meteoric iron. Hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm leaning toward regular iron because I think it'll just look a little better. So let's start with two health hammer heads. We're going to start with a single health hammer itself, and then I think in the next episode we will cover how to add more health hammers and how to gear things up, hopefully, assuming we have enough resin, but gear them up to make them work faster. So I'm going to get this smithing work going. And I'll see all of you in just a moment. Okay, here we are. We're getting hot. Let's get our hammers on. And right here next to the hammer is the hell hammer head. Now, you have two options. Well, if you're using iron, you have one option is to smith it. But if you're using a bronze, and bronze is the lowest material you can use to make a hell hammer, you can also just cast the hell hammer. However, I don't like doing that because casting it uses an extra ingot. I don't know why, but it does. So 
So we're going to smith all of these into two hellhammer heads and call it a day. All right, good morning, everyone. We are here at the base of our tower, and we are ready to get started with crafting everything we need. Now, let's start with the help hammers. I'm just go ahead and make both of them, get them out of the way. And you'll see here that I have a bunch of pine logs. It's because pine is now my most common wood type, and we are going to need a lot of wood. Probably not all of this, but a lot of it, we'll say. I'm going to go ahead and just saw up a bunch of this here. And we need to make a bunch of different things for this project. We need two large gears, which means we need to reserve basically 16 for two large gears. 16 resin for two large gears. And a lot of sticks are involved in that. We also need to have a toggle for our help hammer, and that is going to be here. There's four more. And then we also need a health hammer base. There's one more for that. So, yes. So each health hammer setup is going to require a minimum of that. But we also need a windmill rotor. Probably two. We're going to need some angled gears. And that's just for getting the rotors to connect to the large gear. Let's figure another, oh, I don't know, eight more angled gears just to be safe. That's just a minimum. That leaves us with 12 more resin. That's that's enough for now. <laughs> we'll see how far we get today with the resin that we have. So let's get started on, I think, the large gears. Let's get this going on. And a bunch of sticks. And a whole bunch of wood. And then we need our healthier hammer, our saw, and our chisel. And we want eight of these. Except that we need a new saw already. Wow, that, uh, that really chewed through that pretty good, didn't it? And there we go. Eight large gear sections. And then we need to combine them with a wooden axle and some boards to make the final version. The actual final gear. And to make the log, or the axle, we need a, a log, a hammer, and some fat. That gives enough for two of these gears, and that's what we need. There we go. They do not stack. Okay, so we have our two large gears. Next, we need to probably get our windmills sorted out. So let's get our resin up here so we can take a look at the windmill rotor. So that needs we'll do two windmills for now. Our hammer and our chisel. Two rotors. And then let's make a few of these angled gears. There we go. Four angled gears. And then we are going to need a bunch of additional logs or additional axles. So let's just make a whole bunch of these. There we go. And that is why we've been saving fat for so long and in such quantities, rather than using it for ceiling crocs and for oil lamps, is that we need a ton of these. Lastly, we are going to need a bunch of sails for our rotors. So let's do that. And I brought enough here for two full sails. Sorry, three full sails, apparently. But you know what? Let's leave it at two for, you know, let's do three. Why not? There we go. Okay, all of our linen is gone now. But we have plenty of sails for building big old windmills. So, once you have your materials, it's time for us to head upstairs, where we are going to start by probably knocking out a little bit of a wall here for us to work on. Our platform, unless we can just sort of stand here to do it. It might not be possible. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's not. So let's just pop these out here. So we will need to walk out into this area out here. So the first thing is we need to put an axle down. And the reason we have these 
walnut stairs here. One is so that we can have our rotors pop out a little bit so we don't have the blades or the sails intersecting with the blocks up here. Otherwise, they would just pop off. So we're going to do that. The second reason is that if we put this here, because this limestone block is chiseled, this will not actually connect to it. Let's get our rotor on here. And then we can also put on these sails and just get this moving. It doesn't really matter that it's going to be turning for now. It'll either stop or go and we will just work around it. But as you can see, we have a five length sail on here and it spins just fine. Now, for the interior here, and here's where we might have to start working on this from the outside because this is a bit of a tight fit. But we are going to actually probably tear this down too. I don't need this grass ceiling up here. Now we are going to need something with which to place our large gear against. We're going to start by putting the angled gear on not there apparently. Can we do it like this? And then put our angled gear on here like this? No. We cannot. Well, we're going to temporarily remove that block to put a dirt block there. And then I guess we will remove this guy again. Bye. I'll tuck you on there. And then we will place this there. That's what we needed to do. And then we'll just put our drive shaft the whole way down our tower here. And now that we've actually placed the angled gear on here, we are safe to remove this and place our decorative block back in there. We could also come in here if we wanted to and remove the dirt blocks up there. And I think I might once we come up from the outside. And there we go, folks. We now have a functioning windmill. It doesn't do anything for us yet, but boy, oh boy, will it. Now, you might be wondering why I am opting to use, at this point, two windmills rather than just one, or two sails, not just one. And that's because I want to connect multiple machines to this whole powertrain. And I also want to maybe gear it up so that some of those machines run faster. And if we can gear them up, by connecting the output of another large gear, say down here, to the central shaft of a second large gear, also down here. And that way we will be stepping up the power at the cost of torque. And how do you get more torque? Well, that is by adding more windmills or by gearing down. But that's kind of not what we want to do. We just need the more power from the more windmills to run a higher speed powertrain. So what we're going to do here is we're going to bring this down into what we designated as our transmission room. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right here. Okay, there we have our powertrain installed. And this, as I said, will be our transmission room where we will be able to send power from here to wherever we need to go. 
And today we're going to do that specifically for our help hammer, which will be going pretty much straight that direction, actually. Which is kind of nice. So let's go see what kind of angle we need to come at, because if we could just go straight off of here, that would be amazing. That would save us so much more in materials because of the lack of needing angled gears. So yeah, let's go see how that would look and how that would work. So we are lined up on negative 803 here on the x-axis. Come to 803. Do you know? That. That might be perfect. Yes. Oh, yes. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? That is perfect. We are so doing that. We are so, so doing that. So let's take a breather and we're going to shift focus from the powertrain to our actual smithy over here where we're going to be doing all of our forging and smithing. And let's get the room ready and get it all set up so that we can bring our powertrain in and have a place to actually have it output our power for us, which will be right in line with this. And that, oh, that's so nice. Okay, folks, I have put together a bit of a project bin out here. And let's take a look at what we have inside. We have some mechanical parts, including a help hammer with a wooden toggle and the base. I've also brought along some building supplies. We have some basalt, sandstone, chert, a little bit of bauxite. I don't want to melt anyone's eyes too badly today, so we'll keep it kind of light on the bauxite. Some fire clay and some blue clay and mortar. Fire clay brick specifically for color, and the mortar and the blue clay for binding material. Now, as far as where I want this to go, I'm kind of thinking, I did like what I suggested of putting it just off this corner, like a nice straight route off this corner would, I think, line up really nicely. So I think we'll go with that. I don't want this to come over this way too much and crash into whatever we might have going on out here. So yeah, I think going off that corner is perfect. Ow, my legs. So let's get started with digging some of this out here. Okay, so here we go. This might be a pretty good spot. So this could be where we place our anvil. And then over here, we'll dig a couple blocks this direction. There is our fourth block. You know what? I can almost bring that back this way by one block. Yeah, let's do that. Let's put our anvil here instead. We'll still dig this out. But we will have our health base over here. And people put our base here. Ooh, no. No, no, no. We need to move you again. And the reason is that this 803 needs to line up with where the toggle goes. So it's going to go there. So what we'll have is we'll have a little tube running down here and over to the transmission room. And that will come right up here to power the wooden toggle with as few bends as possible. That means our anvil will go here. And that's fine. And that means that we will need to dig out a bit of this over here to make room for the base. There we go. And there we go. We have our setup here. And I think what we'll do is I want to plan for an eventual additional health hammer to set up over here. Right about here would be perfect. And that way we can just run the transmission line through this health hammer and over to the second one. As I was saying, it'll come right to here. It'll bend right there and connect to our second hub hammer right here. And I think that will be perfect. And that will give us plenty of room to sort of dig out a little bit over this direction and put a couple other things that we'll need, barrels and boxes and forges and things. So let's go ahead and we're going to dig our conduit here over to the basement or rather from the basement so we're going to bring it out to negative 275 so let's go down over to here and we will just dig that straight out hey look at that not too shabby 
Let's go get some more angled gears and install this. And check it out. We have a... I'd say functioning. I mean, it's not really doing anything for us, but it is a working help hammer, just with no anvil. Now you'll see it's kind of going pretty slow. That's because we don't have much wind going on today. These are turning pretty slowly, but they shouldn't be struggling to actually run this. This should be going... Basically, it's going as fast as it can, given the amount of wind we have. So I vote that we put a pause on the mechanical aspect, and let's start building out the aesthetic aspect of our actual smithy over here, and get rid of you, so that we can have a nice place to come and do all of our smithing. Alright guys, it is break time because, as you can see, it is very high rift activity out there, so we are inside. And I wanted to take a minute here to show you guys a solution that someone proposed to me. And that is, well, a solution specifically for this really dark area here. And that is to take your chisel and just remove and replace <gasps> one voxel. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. It's a revolution. Viva la revolution? Question mark? I think I have to... You have to do every single block. Needs it done once. So that's not fixing it there, but maybe we're just not hitting all of the places that need to get hit. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Oh, that's so much better. <laughs> my eyes, my soul. Ugh. Now that's a little weird, but uh, you know what? I'll take it. I will absolutely take it. Oh my goodness, look how much better that looks. Look. Well, look. Look here, you. Look here. But yes, I'm going to be getting to this, and we'll get this done. While it is grim and dark and rainy outside and rifty. Oh my goodness. It worked. Look at this. Look, Ma. No lantern. Wow. Wow. I... I need to go and find whoever wrote that note in a comment, and I need to thank you profusely for fixing this lighting issue. And they said that the problem is from using the Chisel Tools mod to copy blocks. And removing and adding a voxel, just a single one from every block that you copied, seems to resolve the issue. And boy, does it ever. And that looks so much nicer. Oh my goodness. Ah, okay. Let's get back to building here. So we have here a little room that I think is the perfect size for what we need. We'll have room for our extra health hammer right here. And then that there. So we need to probably push that wall back one more block. We are probably going to be poking out from the land a little bit, and I might just cover it up with some dirt to make it look like we're still fully underground, or it could be fun to just have like a little bit of the building poking out the back. I don't know yet. But I'm envisioning having like a forge over here and maybe some storage, I don't know, over here. But before we get to that, we need to actually put in the walls that we want. And that's going to be some basalt but also some chert and some fire clay bricks. I've kind of decided on what I want to do for the decorations in here. And so we are going to, ooh. Ooh, new question. Do I do polished basalt or do I do basalt brick? Maybe both, maybe both. So I want to start by lining the base of the inside of the wall here with basalt brick. And so we're going to remove all this chert and replacing it with base salt, but not you. And then we are going to leave a bit of a space right here. We're gonna leave a two by three space, and that's because I want to leave a hallway here for, well, eventually we'll have a hallway here that will lead us down to our cementation furnaces. And so we're gonna leave that part of the wall alone, but the rest of this gets to go. 
And there we have it. Looking a little better already. Now, for the walls here, I am thinking I actually want to slim this down just a little bit. We're not going to have like a full ledge everywhere, but I do want to have some texture, some depth to these walls. And especially over here where our forges will actually be, or at least the fires. I think the forges themselves will probably put like in a corner somewhere. Maybe one over here to have easy access to the help hammer and the anvil. I'm going to clear this out. And I'm also going to clear out probably this whole layer here too, I think. And what we're going to do here is in this sort of back layer, we're going to put some chert rock down as a nice backdrop. It fits with what we're working with. It fits the land. And I think that chert and basalt go together pretty well. And these are all chiseled blocks. So if we mine them by accident or on purpose, at least we won't break them down into their constituent little pieces anymore. Next, I want to see how fire clay bricks look. Yes. Yes. That reminds me kind of of what we have going on here with the fire clay bricks against the chert here. I think it looks really nice. And also with the redwood, I think that works pretty well. So what I want to do here is in the corners, we'll put some of these fire clay bricks. And I think we'll also do one probably here at the door or where the doorway will be. And we'll also put one, let's see, probably here to cap off this area. Oh, no, one more block. There we go. And then what I want to do is I want to come in here and sort of find spaces to put columns and space these out relatively evenly. They'll be perfect. So let's just do a central one there. Because this room is rectangular, not square. So it's not going to line up perfectly in every direction. Although it does line up like off center. Look at that. That actually does line up pretty well. Wow. Okay. I'm digging it. And we'll do that and that giving us four in the center. Do we want four in the center? I think we do. I think four is good. And then we're going to need a few more of these, but I'm going to put these here. Like so. And then I guess we'll do some more over here as well. And that's how you blow two stacks of fire clay bricks. And then what we'll do is we'll come through here and these will be where we keep like our storage nooks. We'll have some, probably some trunks in here. But these are kind of blocky looking right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in with our chisel and our hammer. We'll put our torch down or our lantern down for better light because torches just don't cut it. And we're going to chisel basically all of these a little bit. Not a ton, but just enough to give us some definition. And we will do all these by hand because it is going to be a quick chisel job. I don't think it's going to require the pantograph. And that's a pretty good start, but I think I want to bring it in a little more. So we'll do something like this right up here. I missed one. And there we go. Now we have some nice, somewhat rounded off little sections here that we can then tuck some trunks into. Do I want to do it even farther? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Absolutely. There we go. Mm, maybe for the small ones, we go the whole brick. That might look a little less derpy. Yes, there we go. That's what we wanted to do. Now, for the entrance here, I am thinking I want to do probably some more basalt stone bricks. So let's go ahead and get those rolling here. We are going to kind of have this spill out a little bit. So what I want to do is I might actually want to use the two by two gates here. And so we'll have like a column that goes up and supports whatever we have going on up top there. But I'm thinking we have this sort of like big entryway here so we can open the doors, throw them open and let some air and heat out. So yes, I think we'll do some of that. 
which means, let's see, that's going to be four blocks tall. That means that we want to have a frame roughly like this. So something a bit like that is perfect. We'll probably want to have this part of the entryway be a little raised up. So it doesn't look quite so constrained in here. But then we'll have the ceiling slope down into the forge proper, where it'll be a much shorter ceiling. Now, something else I could do, you know what? Maybe we don't do the super tall doors. Maybe we do a pair of the shorter ones. And that way we can kind of leave some space up here for airflow. I think I might like that more. And then, and then we have the actual floors. So I want to start with, let's tear out this floor first. And then we'll worry about getting some interesting flooring in here. Okay, now for the floors, I'm thinking I want to line it with some more basalt. It'll give it a nice dark outline. And then, let's see, probably starting here and here, we'll bring that outline to the interior. So now I have a very, very thick border, very dark border. How do we bounce that out? Well, we bounce it out with some bauxite cobblestone slabs. You heard me, folks. You heard it here first. Some bright orange bauxite. But we will ring this on with bauxite to really make the room pop. Yes. Yes, that is a lot of pop and pizzazz. And then we'll come through with the sandstone in the middle to lighten it up a bit. So a very dark, bold color, very bright, bold color, and then a more neutral color. It's not neutral because it is bright yellow, but it's kind of a subdued yellow. And that will help give us a nice bright forge. Well, once we have lights in here. And I am thinking, let's see, do we do these in the middle here? Uh, uh, you know what? Let's let's try it without first. I'm going to actually chisel these up so we can reuse them if we want to. So do you prefer it with just the bauxite? Yeah, I think I do like this better because we could chisel them into a diagonal, but given the patterns we have in the room, I think it didn't look very good. And let's go and figure out what kind of doors to put on here. Okay, so looking at our choices of wood colors here, we could go with what we've been doing for our gates and doors and go with the redwood, but because we have that box light below, I think we want to skip that. And so I'm leaning toward trying some kapok. Because kapok, when you cut it up, is a nice yellow wood. So it's yellowy. It's not yellow, but it's much more orange yellow than, say, oak. And I think this kind of helps evoke the sandstone of the interior, but on the walls with a door. So let's get a couple nails. And let's get over here and see about building one of these doors. And... Let's start with one. If we don't like it, then we won't waste too many nails. But let's see. Yeah, I like that. It's not quite as yellow as the Kapok slabs. It's not quite as bright. But I think it looks... A block is in the way. Oh, you should take up this. Oh, nice. So it actually keeps you from blocking that off. That's pretty cool. A little postern hole here. I wish you could open that too. That'd be amazing. Okay, yeah, let's do a second one of these. And then let's get a little bit of an arch going in here as well. Okay, now the problem here is we're going to place this like that and it's going to open this way. So we need to tear up both of these and we need to tear this down too, just a little bit and temporarily. And we're going to have to place them a bit like this and then that. There we go. And then we can come in here and rip this one out. Put our basalt bricks back in place. And then we can come in here and drop down our gate again. Nice. Nice. 
A hundred percent. I love it. Okay. So, let's get a bit of an arch in here. Should be pretty quick and simple. Nothing super fancy about it, but necessary. And I think just a very simple, probably, yeah, maybe even like that. Yeah, let's do it like that, and that way we can kind of start bringing the roof down a little bit earlier. And maybe, maybe even, we don't need to have the roof be taller here. We can just do that. Now, as for our ceiling, I am thinking once again about going with some limestone because it just works really well for a low ceiling to help the rooms feel larger. And because I think we just want a neutral color in here. So we'll go from very dark and bold to brighter to bright at the very top. So let's get the dirt out and the ceiling in. All right, we are very close to being able to call this job here done. We need to now dig out a bit of a forge area slash a smeltery area. And I think I'm going to build a smaller one than we did in the last season. We had a four by four and no, we had a two by two with four total fire pits. We just don't need that much. So I'm going to dig this up here and we are going to Get to the surface right there and then i think we will just build this out of the basalt stone bricks there we go we have a sort of walk-in area to where our forges or our smeltery will be and we do need to cap that off up there so we don't have rain putting our fires out or creepy crawlies popping in to say hello so we're just going to sort of pop this up a little bit. And then we'll cap it off with something like this and something else. We need like a, a staircase in here, I think. Or maybe just slabs. Do we do slabs instead? So we have a bit of slabbage going on here can even probably slim this down a good bit. And let's do that by maybe cutting these back and forgetting these are set to be horizontal only. And then let's even do that here as well. I'll break those guys. And then for our final act, we will just take our chisel and hammer. And we'll just kind of whack these back. And now we have an official chimney sticking out of the ground. As promised. So I'm going to go and get some accoutrements and some storage that we're going to throw in here to hold all of our utensils and working supplies and things. So I'm going to go grab those and bring them in. And then I think it's time for us to, well, wait for the wind to pick back up. And once it does, we will put this guy into service. folks. We're going to come in here and put the last finishing touches in here with some fire pits. And we're also going to put in our crucibles and get these ready for some serious smelting in the future. But we have this health hammer over here doing a whole lot of nothing at the moment because it is swinging and not hitting anything. Let's fix that. But first, just so you know, this gets noisy. Don't worry, this never gets annoying. All right, hush you. 
So we're going to start using our health hammer today. I'm going to show you how this thing works. It's actually very, 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 very simple. And the health hammer can do exactly two things. But it does them very well. And actually, there's a third thing it can do, but it's not super necessary. And we don't have access to that yet, so we'll leave that for later. But the big thing, the first big thing, is it is very good at hammering out iron blooms because you save a lot of hammer durability and time on your own part. Especially if you can get multiple health hammers working around one anvil or speed up your health hammers with multiple large gears. And I probably should have waited till this one got a little hotter to start the second one, but that's okay. So once these heat up, we will throw our anvil down again and we will put these on the anvil and then we'll stand back and watch. Okay, we are almost at temperature. Let's drop our anvil down and let's grab, whoop, oh, let's get our tongs. Tongs first. Where'd the tongs go? They're over here. Okay, tongs. There we go. And oh, you're in there. On you go. And now you can see that with every swing of the hammer, it is either removing a box that doesn't belong or it is adding one. And if you started any iron ingots from blooms by hand and found that it didn't have enough material to finish, well, this will actually sort of generate the material for you as it works. So this will be able to fix that. So don't throw away your iron blooms if you've been working them by hand and you have a couple that just couldn't be finished. Save for your health hammer. So yes, that is the first thing these are very good at. Or good at, and very much so. Let's grab our next one and start a couple more of these. But the second thing these can do is they can hammer out plates of any material, provided that the anvil it's working with is of the appropriate level to use it. So on this tin bronze anvil, we can make up to iron plates. We cannot do meteoric iron or steel, but we can make plates out of copper and milipichalcos and bronzes and gold and silver and so on, all the way up through iron. And I think we should go ahead and make a couple plates that we can get some more lanterns in here. I'm thinking let's make some tin bronze plates. We'll start heating a couple of these up. And once they get hot, we'll be able to work them on here, just like with the iron blooms. And here we go. Here is one of the sort of downfalls to the help hammer, is that if there isn't wind, or isn't much wind, your work speed will go down quite dramatically. Now, as long as your windmills are getting enough wind, regardless of its speed, you can typically end up with enough torque from a low wind day to run multiple health hammers at a lower speed that ends up still being faster than running a single health hammer at maximum speed. But for now, we only have the one health hammer and we're going to just suffer through this process for now, I suppose. Now you can, at your option, grab a hammer and if you want to speed the process along, you can actually come through here with a split and break especially the slag. So we can come in here and just smack a bunch of the slag out of here and really speed up the process without using too much hammer durability. Do note that at least in the current version of the game, hell hammers do not have durability. These will last forever and you never need to replace them. And the hammer head material itself does not affect anything as far as whether it can hammer out a particular material or not. So there we go. Let's get a plate going on to show you how that works. So for a plate, you're going to crouch and right click like normal, but although you get the menu here, because this is still an anvil, you must select the plate option. If you pick anything else, the hub hammer will smack your ingot, and I think it'll actually still try to smash it into a plate. So beware, <laughs> you might end up with a plate shaped, well, anything else, and you don't want that, typically. And my, when the wind slows down, does this hurt? Now 
And there we have our very first plate made from, made on a hellhammer. And that, folks, is the basics of a hellhammer. I am looking very much forward to being able to work on plates and blooms without having to spend hammer durability or my own time actually concentrating on what I'm doing. I can just sit here and throw some music on in the background and hammer away. Or really just manage the forges, honestly. Anyway, folks, I hope you enjoyed the episode. I hope you learned something about how to build a help hammer and how to hook up to your powertrain. In the coming episodes, we're going to talk about how to expand this. Because, again, this is great, but it's kind of slow, right? I mean, right now it's okay. But we'd still be faster at this with our own hammer, wouldn't we? So we want to speed this up so it's not such a painfully slow process. And we can. We have some options. We're going to use this health hammer to hammer out lots of plates so that we can fix up the very fancy armor that we have. Finally, the full set. And then, once that's done, we can start thinking about preparations to go and tackle the Resonance Archives. But that'll be a tale for next episode and beyond. As always, my name is Hazard Thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.